The XTC Podcast. What do you call that noise? What do you call that noise? Today we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of Apple Venus Volume 1, a landmark in XTC's career and the album many fans, and I might be one of them, regard as their finest achievement. Hello again, I'm Mark Fisher, and I'm very excited to say we are joined this time by none other than producer Hayden Bendel, a man once described by Colin Moulding as being like Father Christmas and your favourite uncle all rolled into one. And having spoken to him, I can attest that he is. Uh, We've got a tremendous conversation up ahead, and first we will warm you up with some music. Each month we like to hear the noise that you've been making that connects in some way to XDC. This time it's the turn of The Real Numbers, whose fourth album, Thank You, is freshly out on SoundCloud. And here is Dave Ambrose to tell us the thinking behind a song called Lydia Pinkham. What do you call that noise? Hi, Mark. My name is Dave Ambrose, and I currently live in Denver, Colorado in the U.S. I was introduced to XTC way back in junior high school when a good friend invited me over to hear his newly purchased vinyl copy of Black Sea. Just a few bars into Generals and Majors, and I was hooked. A few years later, I picked up a guitar, formed a band, and started writing songs myself. Fast forward to 2007, I moved to San Francisco, California, and formed a band called The Real Numbers with fellow songwriter Lawrence Gradesca. Our mission? To write and perform smart, melodic, power-pop music influenced by bands like Jellyfish, Fountains of Wayne, Ben Folds 5, and of course, XTC. Over the following several years, we released three albums, one of which even included an acoustic cover of Senses Working Overtime. We began recording our fourth release in 2015, but after a catastrophic hard drive failure set us back, the album was put on the back burner while various members of the band got married, became parents, took on new jobs, and moved to different cities. Slowly, though, we kept at it, recording a bit at a time here and there, gradually moving the ball forward, and now... I'm stupidly happy to announce that the fourth, albeit perhaps final, release by The Real Numbers is finally here. The album is titled Thank You, and while I think several of the songs have an XTC-ish bent, none more so than this tune, Lydia Pinkham. For fans of history, Ms. Pinkham was an early female entrepreneur at the U.S. who sold a regenerative vegetable tonic marketed at women during the mid-1800s. How's that for an obscure reference? This song also features keyboard and piano playing by Roger Joseph Manning Jr., who some listeners will undoubtedly recognize from the band Jellyfish, as well as Beck, the Licorice Quartet, and others. I hope you enjoy the tune. More of Thank You and our previous albums can be found at our website, www.therealnumbers.us. Thanks for giving us this opportunity to share our music, and please keep up all the great work you do with What Do You Call That Noise? Mother just used to sigh and pine away And long for days When girls wore gowns and boys wore trousers Sepia themes that slowly turn to gray Mundane parades Our memories just like wilted flowers fade Now everywhere she goes She's walking in circles Speaking in riddles But I think she feels The Miracle Mile was her bright Broadway, her Champs Elysees of rushing cars, quixotic towers. Now, once in a while, she sips her holiday. These scenes replay the hours past, she's checking out to.
Thank you very much, Dave Ambrose and The Real Numbers. That's got the pulse racing. And if you missed that link, I'll include it in the podcast information. This podcast couldn't happen without the generous supporters on Patreon, to whom we all owe a tremendous debt. If you like what you hear and you'd like to join them, it's very straightforward. You just have to pop over to patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher and decide on your level of support. There are three levels, and if you opt to be a knight in Shining Karma, I'll read out your name at the end of each episode. A reminder, you can buy your copy of What Do You Call That Noise, an XDC Discovery book at xdclimelight.com, where you can also find details of all the podcasts. What do you call that noise? It was on the 22nd of February 1999 in the UK and a day later in the USA that XDC's seven-year silence was broken and we all got to hear the masterpiece that is Apple Venus Volume 1. And we are very privileged to be joined today by the producer of that album, Hayden Bendel. Hello, Hayden. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you very much. Delighted you could join us. Thank, Thank you. you for this. Thank you. Um, Hayden Thank you. is a producer, a mixer, and an engineer, as well as being a former piano tuner. He was the chief engineer at Abbey Road Studios for 10 years, and he has worked with, I'm going to do a big deep breath here, Bebop Deluxe, Steve Harley, Paul McCartney, five albums by Kate Bush, Tina Turner, Massive Attack, Bonnie Tyler, Van Morrison, Ryuchi Sakamoto, Pet Shop Boys, Everything But The Girl, and Pope Benedict the <laughs> Sixteenth, uh, which is even better than when we had the Bishop of Leeds on the podcast. I think you've sort of gone one ecclesiastical level higher there. <laughs> uh, and in this episode, we're getting two producers for the price of one because we're also joined by Guy Sigsworth. Hello, Guy. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. Guy is a songwriter, a producer, and an expert in early music. He has worked with Seal, Bjork, Goldie, Madonna, Alanis Morissette, and is a, man, a member of Fru Fru with Imogen Heap. He's also worked with Sean McGee, who you can hear on our Mama podcast from May 2022. Uh, and you can also read Guy in What Do You Call That Noise, an XDC discovery book talking about Towers of London, This Is Pop, and Easter Theatre, which he compares to Prokofiev and Benjamin Britten in its level of ambition. So you can see the sort of scale of... of ambition our conversation is going to have, I, I, I think. Yeah. So could I just butt in? Yeah. Guy, I had no idea you were in Fru Fru. Yeah, <laughs> I'm one half of it. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. Man. I love it. Yeah. I haven't, uh, um, I'm so pleased to <laughs> tell you <laughs> that I'm a fan. I didn't realize oh, great. <laughs> Well, I'm a huge Kate Bush fan, so love, love. Well, I, 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 yeah, yeah I, she did all the singing. Yeah. <laughs> it does yeah. help, I know. <laughs> anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry back, back to your point. No, well, you keep on going because it, it, it was occurring to me when I was looking at your respective CVs that, 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 that it seems to me inevitable that there must be a huge crossover. So maybe in, in the course of the conversation, we'll discover uh, moments where, where, where the two of you have touched. Um, in terms of XEC, Guy is a fan. Hayden was on the record. Guy, were you... Where does Apple Venus fit in 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 your sort of sense of XDC's career? Um, I utterly love it, and listening again to it uh, in preparation for this podcast, I was amazed to how it instantly sort of bewitched me all over again. And I was not like expecting an XDC record, and it is one of these things where I think I was in um, an airport shopping mall in France, and they played Easter Theatre, and it's one of those. I just have to stop and just listen to this. And I might even miss the flight. I've just got to listen to this and then discovered that they'd put a new record out. Um, and I just think it's a gorgeous kind of climax to this journey they took us on, starting, you know, with um, uh, white music to this. is is just a fantastic sort of story of um, growth and innovation. Yeah. Well, actually, that that, that is a good way into... Hayden, because you have a long history with XTC because you were there at the 3DEP right at the start. What, what, what are your memories of then? I, I was. I, I remember the keyboard player and the, the... No, I remember them all. I remember them all. And I, I thought uh, their level of musicianship was great, actually. Mm. Even then, even yeah. then. I thought it was great. So I haven't really been involved with them because I did that and then... Uh, is science friction on that? EP? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, right, yeah. Okay. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, and maybe I uh, bumped into Andy, who was working very closely with a friend of mine, John Leckie, uh, when he was doing Dukes of Stratosphere stuff. Mm -hmm. and that, and that. But I, I wasn't really involved with them. The next thing uh, they phoned me up, or Andy phoned me up in nineteen, whenever it was. I don't know. 
just prior to doing Apple Venus and uh, we hadn't been in touch with each other at all. And I, I was in Waitrose actually, and I said, oh, look, can I? <laughs> <laughs> he blurted out, oh, we've been following you. We'd like you to do our album. And I thought, well, this is great. Uh, you yeah, know, I wonder what they're up to. Uh, and um, so it, I haven't been involved with them at all, or uh, even in contact with them at all for years and years and years and years. And uh, then this turned up. <laughs> this is a complete digression, but there's a sort of little bit of a, a sort of supermarket theme emerging with with Guy listening to Easter Hit Theatre in <laughs> yeah. the airport yeah. lounge yeah. somewhere, and you listening to I, Andy I, Partridge I, in the I, hotel. I, actually, uh, it, it was Sainsbury's in. Um, it's Sainsbury's. <laughs> yeah, in, in Maidstone That's, or Ashford. Ashford. Mm. Uh, Sainsbury's in Ashford. <laughs> I'm that trying to it. remember if they still had our price in airports or something equivalent to that. Um, I don't know where I was, but it, it was one of those. I just have yeah. to drop everything and listen. It, it, very occasionally, you know, and I, I'd listen to the radio and a great song would come on and I'd have to stop the car and, yeah, just, yeah. you know, I, 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 it, I, I, it was like that, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is good. Yeah, it is good. It's a good song. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and Hayden, then that, because, I mean, that is quite interesting because you had that gap uh, of all those years and the music is either end of their canon. The difference between white music and, and 3D EP and, and Apple Venus is is infinite is extending the word too much but you wouldn't say that they're the same group would you well from a songwriting yeah i would would you yeah. actually yeah i i i can see a sort of a because as this young sort of they were introduced to the studios a right. uh, some punky band from swindon you know through virgin and simon and richard were quite interested in uh, and um i thought you know they had such a um, but Andy especially, and and and, and uh, Colin to a certain extent, but the keyboard player, I can't remember who, who he was. Barry Andrews. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I thought they had such an artistic, musical point of view, and I'm always attracted to that. You know, it, it, I, I'm not particularly influenced by style or... or mm. I mean, for a producer and engineer to say this, uh, I'm not particularly influenced by fashion. I'm really inf influenced. I, uh, the thing that seduces me, wh whatever in whatever context the music is, is the musicality. Mm. So I thought Andy and Colin and and Bar Barry really lent something very special to the combination as well. And uh, Andy wasn't as forthright then as he became. He, he um, and so he, he his talents were were there, but. I think he was a bit reticent to you know, bring them forward because I think it's the first thing they did. And so I think most people, when they do the first record, instead of wanting it to be great, they just want it to have no mistakes on, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's a fairly, it's not as relaxed as, uh, as it becomes. But mm. sorry, just to tie it up. Mark, to what you said before, I, I, I could, I could see this interest in musicality and form throughout. I, I think there is a, yeah. there, there is a relationship. It, it does tie up. Somewhere. Yeah, that's very interesting because I'm particularly interested in that period in the 1970s when, when you were first working and the where. Um, well, there was the the myth. I think it is a myth when you look back at, about the, you, to be a punk band. You just needed three guitar oh no it was away. great i mean i i did stuff with the adverts i did stuff with magazine and they're great mm. songs mm -hmm. really good you know good songs yeah. as i say I, I i think you know artists necessarily if they're signed to a record company would would jump onto a fashionable bandwagon yeah. but thankfully i don't think it defines their music as much as they imagine it does. It, it, I don't think you can hide that sort of level of musicality. And even no. if you say, oh, no, it needs to be punky or it needs to be rocky or it needs to be blues or it needs to be that or it needs to be classical or it needs to be operatic, whatever it, it needs to be, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, I, I mean, I, I remember magazine, I mean, the, Incredible songs and incredible musicality. It wasn't three chords. And to be honest, yeah. if you listen to the Sex Pistols, it's not three chords. No, mm -hmm. I mean not that I do, but you know, if you if you choose to, it's not it's not three chords. No. I think just during that punk period, there was a lot of uh, people pretending they couldn't play their instruments, but yeah. they really could. Even the Sex Pistols, you could hear they really actually exactly play very well. 
maybe Sid maybe Sid couldn't play, but the others really could play very well. Yeah, yeah, they could exactly exactly mm. that. And yeah, I did things with Captain Sensible and the and the Damned and mm. all that. And it, it was um, great sort of songs and great musicality. All right, within a genre that that um, projected this anarchic point of view, which is quite exciting and nice. But the 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 music was. Uh, Actually, quite classical in its mm. in its in its formation. And what do you think, or what do you, did you think as a producer when you get given that set of, of of demos that they had, and they'd accumulated, they hadn't, hadn't recorded anything for seven years, so they'd recorded a lot of material. And um, unlike, a, a, well, I don't know. You can tell me whether this is like other bands or not. But but when you listen, when I listen back to those demos they're very very fully realized and uh, if i was a producer i might just say oh gosh they've done this already there's nothing left for me to do do, well yeah um it's 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 quite uh it's quite an interesting process is that i i love the demos i love the songs most most of them I, i loved uh when it came to the recording i was actually sort of quite disappointed um because uh, not the fact that it was hard work. Yeah, you know, I mean, most as you know, if you do an album, it's a it's a mountain to climb, sort of emotionally, time wise. If you're involved in it financially, financially, it, you know, it's it, it's a huge amount of work. Which I'm very, I I love recording. I love making albums. In fact, I'm in the middle of doing one now. But um, I imagined that they would play together a lot more than they did. I wanted it to be much liver than it is. It is extremely overdubbed. And I I, I think... Uh, I, I really want to say this kindly because I'm very fond of them, but I, I think it's a little bit sterile. In Chalk Kills and Children, the SEC biography, you're quoted as saying the songs were braver than the recordings. Oh, well, that's how I feel. Yeah. That's how I feel. I, 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 I hoped and I tried. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd love that sort of musicality to have transferred into the actual recordings. I, I think they're beautifully crafted songs. And I think Andy is a phenomenal singer and a phenomenal guitarist and a phenomenal musician. But He's quite terrified of letting things go, of letting things breathe. So it all feel. I, I mean, I'm pleased you enjoyed it a lot, Guy, because I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm pleased that anybody enjoys it. And it it's great. Uh, and I enjoy it very much from a songwriting point of view, not necessarily from a performance point I of view. I wonder if, though, that s- some aspects of that, which may be sort of counterintuitive, but like, for instance, I remember when I listened to the first song, River of Orchids, there's something actually really strange and kind of wonderful about the fact that the pizzicato strings and the brass sound like they're playing in two isolated studios in, on, on two different continents. But, you know, they're, they're, the fact they don't sound like they're in the same room, I kind of like that. It's kind of weirdly great like that. Yeah, weirdly great. Yeah, I, 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 I actually, Guy, interestingly yeah. enough, that's the livest one you did. Okay. <laughs> And I mean, separately, yeah, they were done, they were done yeah. separately. That was, that was done in Studio Two at Abbey Road, Studio One, right? At Abbey Road, hmm. uh, and um, that was subject to the musicians were great uh, and everything, uh, and um, Green Man as well. We did that right. on, the, on the... the the sound of the strings on Green Man is gorgeous. By the way, Hayden, I love the the way you recorded them. I don't know, well, maybe it's just. I, 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 I didn't play a single note. You know. No, <laughs> it's but, the players. But, I know <laughs> it's the players. It's the players in the room, and it's a it's a room. I I know where every cobweb is in that room. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, but uh, River of Orchids, I for me that worked mm. because there is a real sense of performance in that. Mm. Uh, and as I say, that was the least sort of got at performance. That's intriguing because a lot of people would imagine that that because it's got this sort of hard American minimalism kind of aesthetic. Yeah, you know, it sounds like sort of Philip Glass and that kind of stuff a bit. Yeah. So you you imagine it was the most proto one of all. 
No, it wasn't. In fact, Andy and I, because I we we right, I heard the demos. Then I went to Andy's place for a week or so, and I, I bought. I, I think I bought my Pro Tools down. And we did, we did demos for us to work to on the recording. So we'd get te- Tempe worked out and keys and stuff and everything, and and we spent an inordinate amount of time. Um, because, you know, it's just a repeating pattern. Mm. This is very cyclical. Uh, uh, one of us, I don't know who, came up with the idea, why don't we just start off with one note from the pattern in the right rhythm, in the right place, and then add another note. As you know, it gradually evolves into this yeah. cyclical pattern. And we, we spent a lot of time planning that and doing it. But then you just have to write it out and give it to the guys, and then they play it, just, to, just how you've done it. Uh, that was the the track with the least amount of editing. Right. And to me, that's the least sterile one. It's, it feels like a performance. Uh, I'm curious, were the players, did they have some guide thing they were listening to in their headphones or were they just literally hearing it? No, no, they, they don't like it. They don't like it. They, they, all they need is a click. Right. They need a click and something solid like a piano note or something to get them in tune. To tune to or something, yeah. Because anything, anything that is slightly swirly or chorusy or anything string-like yeah, puts them off. <laughs> it really does put them off because they're they're um, you know because it's not fretted instrument. They're constantly adjusting pitch in micro yeah micro ways, and so they they always play with one ear off. So mm. they hear their instruments acoustically, they hear each other acoustically, and they they just need the click there to you know keep them there. Mm. I mean, sometimes when they're being polite, say, so, "Well, could I have a bit of vocal in?" But they only ever say that when the vocalist is in the control room, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a courtesy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just make everybody feel hurt. No, it's not quite <laughs> like that. But you know, it, it's um, no. They they didn't have. They, they may have had some just piano chords. Right. Uh, it just yeah, it's just tuning, mm. just for them to pitch against and um, just a click. Hayden, it's funny that uh, you're already sharing interesting insights, uh, but but truthful uh, from your point of view, insights into the into how you think the recording went. Um, I told Andy Partridge that I was going to be doing this interview with you by mm. email, and he emailed back and he said, "Tell him he can be as cruel as he likes. <laughs> he has my permission." <laughs> uh, we got on pretty well, but when things were falling apart between band members, he caught some of the flack. So he's thinking emotionally from that point of view because of the tension of producing an album. Yeah, yeah I mean. Uh, bless him, he, he did phone me up about a year ago and he said, look, I really want to apologise about the way I behaved, which I thought was very nice because I was pissed off. With, I mean, not 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 with the way he treated me. I mean, I couldn't care less, really. But I, I, ju- I just thought, I get frustrated when I see great potential being wasted. I always, And maybe that's why... I'm a producer and engineer. I love taking advantage of potential. I love pushing things. I love to think. Yeah, I, I always hope that what I do today is the best thing I've ever done. You know. <laughs> it's the best, yeah. certainly the best podcast you've, you've done today. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, the best <laughs> podcast I've ever. In fact, uh, this is only about the second podcast I've ever done. Well, there you are. But you know, <laughs> so uh, Andy was. Very, very nice. And we found out, so we must get together, but of course we didn't and all that. And, and it was very nice talking. So um, I'm, he, he knows it was difficult. He, he knows it was difficult for the whole band. I mean, the band really was falling apart. And uh, not only falling apart because they wouldn't play together. You know, Dave Gregory would come in and say, oh, let's do some guitars. And Andy said, well, that's not very, you know, come in two days later. That's not very good. And that's out of tune. And then Andy would do some guitars and Dave would come in. He said, well, what's Parsi up to on this? And you think, oh, Jesus, just get in the room and play together. And it, it, it's, you know, um, I don't know if you do know, hopefully you don't. But when couples get divorced, sometimes the children gets used get used as ammunition. Mm. Well, I think there was so much shit going on within the band that they were using the music or each other's performances as ammunition. Mm. So I, 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 it was frustrating. And, and it, it took so long. I mean, they, they complained I was slow, but geez. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, 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 in fact, I ran out of time. I didn't mix the album. It's not my mixes. Um, somebody else did it, uh, 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 and 
I needed, I'd, I'd had enough, to be honest. Hayden, I was wondering, is, is one reason why that might be, it, it feels like Andy was very determined to make a kind of non-rock and roll record. Yeah, he was. He was. Yeah, uh, and he had my absolute blessing with that. I, I, mm. I was I was really into it, really mm. into it. I think, well, Andy, I mean, to be fair, I mean, we, we've been making a bit of a joke about it. And I did understand his points of view. He wanted to make it very cinematic in in that I, I don't mean as a cinema soundtrack but as as he wanted to piece it together the way a director would possibly piece a film together like lots of bits of pieces that he could manipulate or we could manipulate and and turn into this sort of mosaic that projected a beautiful picture and I, and he said, oh, this is the way they do films. You know, they'll shoot this and it may be months out of sequence or this or that. And I, I had, I do have sympathy with that artistic intent. It's just that I think for that to work, you've got to have at your disposal a much higher degree of intellectual sophistication than, than was available to us at the time. <laughs> I'm saying that very diplomatically. You said, but the intent I understood, but uh, I was disappointed with the result. And uh, and uh, Nick Nick did the mixing, and he is great, and he's everything, uh, 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 all that. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm not moaning about the mixing, but the mixing took it even further into the direction that I found that unattractive. I I I I. I, I I was hoping it would be much more passionate from the recording point of view and and performance point of view and everything. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I, I think like it's definitely got this anti-rock and roll thing. And one thing you notice about the album is whenever drums are there, they're about as quiet as you can get them short of not being there at all, which which for the band who did Making Plans for Nigel with those kind of yeah. massive yeah, yeah. explosive no, there drums. Was, there, there was... A, <laughs> there, there was... Uh, a real intention not to make it a rock and roll type album with an orchestra. The, the last thing we wanted was a sort of rocky album with a bit of orchestra on. Yeah. And I think we did two albums. Is there volume one and volume two? There's the volume two as well. I, you you were connected, but less involved in, in the second one, which was more rock and roll, which is... Was I? Yeah. I can't remember. I believe. Anyway, that's just going from the from the notes on the sleeves. But. Well, I, I think I was quite involved in the early stages because it was going to be a double album. That's right, yeah, yeah. Which I think would have been a better idea. They couldn't find an, a record company that would agree to that. That was a problem. Not their fault at all, but they had a very difficult relationship with record companies. And, that's and right, stuff, yeah, you know. yeah. And I think they'd come out of a particularly bruising battle with Virgin. Listen, the record's fine. The record's good. It's just as I say, I, I would have liked it to have been a bit, have a bit more of a visceral quality to it because the songs are, are you know have got a, a real passion. The songs are beautifully written, all of them actually. And how how much um, influence did you have on you know something like the Running Order? The the, the famous story with SDC is that Todd Brungren defined the running order. He decided what the running order of Skylarking was going to be. Yeah, he did. And, and he, he actually decided how long it would be as well. Yeah, yeah. I love the period when we actually cared about these things because I care about <laughs> it passionately. I, but... I, <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. I, I, I did an album. Uh, well, I'm always doing albums, thankfully. But this happened to me about four years ago. Um, the mixes, the record company, you know, liked all the mixes uh, and the... Um, uh, the artists uh, and everything, and they said, "Oh, could you come up with a running order, Hayden?" Which I had been thinking about during the course of the album, and uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about you know tempi keys. You know, if you end up in a major key, you don't start the next song uh, uh, sort of semitone down in a minor key, unless it, you know it, all that sort of thing. So keys, moods, you know, make it a bit of a. I hate using the word, but make it a bit of an adventure, a bit of a journey, you know, through through the pieces of material. Yeah, I've I've had to deal with those things myself. I know. Yeah, I yeah. I, I enjoy that. I always enjoyed that aspect of it very much, and so I, I spent sort of five or six hours doing that and put it into Pro Tools and sliding things around and sorting out gaps and everything. And uh, there are some famous people on this album doing duets. I, I sent it off. 
And I got a phone call 10 minutes later. They said, no, it doesn't work, Hayden. I said, what do you mean it doesn't work? You haven't heard it. You couldn't possibly have heard it. And what happened is the marketing guys had looked at the running order. <laughs> and they wanted the most famous people to be on the first tracks. Right. So the eyes were instantly drawn to the most famous people. And I said, well, does that work like that? Do you think it works? Yeah, yeah, that's what we want. I said, what about Keys and Tempe and all that? Ah, nobody listens to an album. And this is definitely an album that you listen to, isn't it? It's one yeah, that you start yeah. and it has a sort of progression. and a, a... So, no, I, I wasn't involved in the running order of this at no. all. No, Because I, I, um, I think it's a bit early right from the beginning to talk about running orders, unless there is a concept. I think they must have decided that during the mixing and, you know, yeah, look at the dynamics of the mixes and is this exciting or is this more tender or is this more introspective uh, I, i'm sure they took a lot of care of it and yeah but uh no i i wasn't i can't claim ownership of that yeah and do do what about like the choice of songs do you get involved in that sort of thing saying yeah i like that one don't like that one maybe not choosing the songs but maybe saying if we're going to do that maybe we should look at the structure of this a little bit is, is this a bit you know could we make more of this part you know could we make that 16 bars longer eight bars longer or is that a bit i i might I can't remember. It was a really long time ago. But I, rather than saying, I don't think we should do this song or I think we should do that song, I most probably waxed lyrical about the ones I was really fond of and yeah. said, let's work a little bit on the on the ones that um, I thought needed a bit more work. Mm -hmm. I, th you're, I think it's Andy quoted in Chalk Hills and Children saying that um, you were really passionate about I Can't Own Her and she, he was a bit um, uncertain about I Can't I Own Her. I loved that, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was really beautiful. Is it a harpsichord on that? It sounds like a zither or maybe it's a harpsichord. Yeah, oh, I know what it is. Yeah, that's my, I played it. it. It's an electric, it's a Burns electric harpsichord. All oh, right, there you go. <laughs> which we scoured the country for. Because Abbey Road used to have one years, a long time ago. And I, I loved the sound. Yeah. I loved the sound. It's a. It's like a, well, it's a harpsichord mm. with a perspex top, a clear perspex top. And you see the, the, these... Um, things would pluck the strings and i mean it, it's a really thin sort of quite pathetic but very romantic sound mm. not as clunky as a real harpsichord you know uh, it's much thinner it's made by a company called burns and um yeah yeah i loved that i really loved that i love the arrangement with those kind of saxophones that remind me a bit of like michael nyman type draftsman's contract saxophones to yeah, and, and yeah, the, yeah. And the strings are beautiful, and it's cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, I, I sound as though I'm being negative about. It. I, I'm, I'm not. But I, I'm not. I, 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 there are great things on it, mm. without without a doubt. They're really good things, I, and it's always difficult because I, I don't. It's not difficult, but I don't claim ownership of anything I've ever done. Yeah, you know, I haven't got a single record at home of anything I've ever done. Or do you not? Nah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the process of doing it. Once it's done, I'm not, you know, it, it's out of my hands. So I, I, I'm not particularly interested. I love the process. And and the process to me I, is really vital. I, 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 I love it. I love it so much. I, I don't want it to end. I want to carry on doing it forever, really. Well, maybe we could talk about the process in this particular case. Yeah. I think it's from the, the sleeve notes of Apple Venus. Colin Moulding says, this is a description of his memory of recording it. He said, you got producers struggling in blizzards to reach the band, holed up in some barn on the Sussex marches like three convicts awaiting Pip and his pork pie, Ten <laughs> temper tantrums which soured the atmosphere for weeks, band members quitting mid-session, producers quitting in mid-session, recording costs spiralling out of control and no money in the kitty to pay for it. Um, um, it sounds like quite a tough time. What and and there was I don't know how much you can remember of the um, the awkwardness of starting off in Chris Difford's studio, which is called Heliocentric, and and then all of that story. But there was there was a, it was a painful birth by the sound of it. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was truly awful, uh, uh, and I think Andy decided, oh come on, let's quit, let's do a runner. He most probably had his reason. I can't remember. I can't remember. And <laughs> the great thing is that um, the, the the tapes got left behind. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to go back. All sorts of. I, I, it, I mean, it's so unprofessional. It's awful. I, 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 but to be honest, I mean, 
I think it should have been handled better. I, I was lumbered with this studio. And it's a lovely environment, and Chris is a really lovely guy, and you know, we kept in touch for a bit, and he, really nice man, and he came to see me a couple of times in my studio. Um, but the studio wasn't working. It wasn't even ready when you when you got there. It wasn't ready. And I thought, well, why, 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 what's the point of this? And, and I, professionalism really matters to me. It, I, it re I, I, you know, I expect people to be able to play, people to be able to sing, studios to work, Pro Tools to work, the operators to know how it works, and, you know, the toilets to be clean and coffee to be made. You know, it, they, they, for me, are givens. You don't book into a studio and all the mixer's all in pieces, or you can't use this and you can't use that. So we're, we're, why are we here? You know, it, and it, it was stressful because, well, the studio didn't work, which stressed me out hugely. Um, Andy and um, Dave were at each other's throats. Colin was sort of worried about the money a lot and sort of, you know, Colin had written some great songs. And the thing is very funny because Andy will work really, really, really hard at songwriting. And Colin, it just seems to flow from him. And Colin's songs generally tend to be the ones that achieve more commercial success, you know. And so there's a, a funny dynamic, a good dynamic between them. It's good. But that that time at Chris Difford's was really, really stressful. And then we went, and we went to a place in the Cotswolds, lovely studio. Uh, what's it called? Chipping Norton? Is it? Yeah. And we went there. And, and I thought this would be great. And they, but we managed to import the stress with us. You know. <laughs> We managed to bring it all along with us, children. It was all packed up, ready to get out again, and, and it did. And, and this time, you know, there was, we, we had a wonderful drummer, you know, Prairie Prince. He, he, he was with us. And that all turned into a fractious thing. I, I think, actually, it's the most fractious album I've ever been involved in. Really the most? Because I can imagine you'll, you'll have been, you know, artists are temperamental people, and Guy, you'll have seen this as well. I, mean, I would yeah. have thought you'll have been in some awkward situations. But this oh, was yeah. the worst. This is the most unpleasant, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really been here. I mean, you get some prats, you know, but, I mean, generally, people are happy. People are happy. People are happy with their job, happy to be in the studio, happy to be recording. So, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I've worked with people and people say, oh, God, she's murder or he's murder, and they've been beautiful. Mm. Most people in the studio are happy. I mean, you, you don't you don't come to the studio because you couldn't get a job at McDonald's, do you? I mean, <laughs> most, most people are there. Most <laughs> most people are there because they really want to be. They don't want to be anywhere else, you know. So, but I I think this was the most fact. Yeah, this was the most fractious album, and, and it's a shame because uh, I I I felt as though I I do have a feeling of guilt about it, and I, I and I try to explain it. I I felt slightly guilty that the record wasn't better but i don't think it was entirely my fault but guy you were just saying that when you listen to this record you don't hear the tension you don't hear the nerves you don't hear the anger no no i mean i i think it's it's different if you've been there um I used to work a fair bit with Mark Stent, who's one of these sort of celebrity mixers. Yeah. And he mostly doesn't produce, he just mixes. And he yeah. told me that he produced one Oasis record and it's the one where basically Noel Gallagher was firing everybody and Bonehead got fired halfway through and all this stuff. And he was saying when he came to mix it, it was suddenly like every track had this kind of history that when he just mixes a record, there is no history. He just hears what's there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he sort of realised that he he preferred the anonymous mixing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. Yeah, I think it was most probably XTC that made me think I've I've had my fill of working with bands. Right, I I don't generally work with bands now. Mm. Was that before or after you moved on to the Pope? <laughs> oh, the Pope worked. Well, I, I worked with dead people as well. He was, he was, he, he was dead. He was dead when I, yeah. I was just supplied with the recordings. Even more compliant. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. I've done stuff with Roy Orbison. I've done stuff with Bob Marley. They're, they're all dead. Dead people are, you know, no trouble. Uh, their estate can be trouble, but, you know, the actual artist in the trouble. But what I do think about Apple... Venus. Well, 
I think it shows what is really positive. It shows how flexible a band can be. Most bands aren't that flexible. Uh, and most bands, unless they're incredible, unless they're an incredible band, most bands, I think it's a fairly tired format. I like be saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have strings on this? Wouldn't it be nice to have brass on this? Or, you know what would be great accompaniment on this is a uh, harp. Or why don't we have an oboe solo there? Or, you know, or let, let's have a really wonderful jazz bass solo. Or Mark Feltham doing an amazing harmonica solo. Or something. You, you know, you've got that flexibility of colours which aren't, aren't available to you in a band situation. Do you think the fact that they ceased to be a live band freed them even more? Because I I mean, it, I know it shouldn't be a consideration, but I think sometimes bands in the studio, there's always the drummer thinking, but how are we going to do this live? Or the guitarist yeah. plays the verse and the yeah. chorus in two different yeah. tunings and he doesn't yeah, yeah. know how he's going to play it live. And... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And when that comes up, I always say, well, I don't care do you, because you, you can do something different live. Yeah. Do it, do it, you know, change the key of the thing or change, you know. Yeah. It, it's a different thing. I, I, I mean, I love the studio. and I, I, I think the studio, you, you take full advantage of the studio environment and then you, you can take full advantage of the live environment and it doesn't have to be the same. In fact, it's generally better if it's not the same. Mm. And if it can be the same, great. And if you've got, I don't know, if you've got a band like, James Taylor or, or Pink Floyd or, or ACDC or whatever you want, you know, any, any, anything like that. You, you know, they, they can really play and they, 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 they've got the expertise to make something great. But it, it, I'd argue against letting the, what, how are we going to do this live? I wouldn't. Yeah, no, I agree too. Wish that to influence what goes on in the studio. Mm. But I have known some musicians get very tetchy about it because they always worry, oh, I don't know what I'll do and I have to do that. And yeah, well. I had the job of preparing a lot of Björk stuff for live. I was a live MD. Oh, really? And the classic thing would be that the songs that sounded impossible to do live often came off the best live because then you had to be creative and accept that you were doing a kind of transcription. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, this album I'm doing now is really good songs. And, and we, we uh, the other day, a couple of days ago, uh, we just spent eight days <clears throat> putting some overdubs on, on stuff. And the last thing we did was uh, a, a couple of really wonderful brass arrangements on, on two of the songs. And um, the guys, the, these two artists, say, oh, this is fantastic, it's great. And I said, it, it is great, but uh, I hope you realise that the song hasn't changed. The song could easily be played and be just as emotive. On a, you know, could be, well, one of them was written on a ukulele, and when I first heard it, it was written and played on a ukulele. And now it's this massive thing. All we're doing is... Um, recording a view of that piece of music. I dislike the idea that any recording is the definitive version of something. I like, I like, I like to think of the song as a sort of living, breathing thing really, that can change. And it, and it sounds like the way you're talking, Hayden, is that, uh, that, that, that when you first encountered those songs for, I think it was Apple, Venus and, and uh, Wasp Star, uh, that, that, that you liked the songs. That's what, what drew you to it, is that the idea of liking the songs, the songs were at the heart of it. Yeah, the songs were fabulous. Yeah, the songs were fabulous. I loved the songs. I can see a, a connection with Kate Bush, not in the sense that XTC sounded anything like Kate Bush, but, but, but it seems to me that both have a, a, a creative approach to song writing so that there isn't any be we've already talked about the 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 sort of unrock and rollness of apple venus but it's like who else writes songs called easter theater who else uh, apart from kate bush will write about a washing machine or whatever she goes in whatever direction she wants yeah. to go and doesn't yeah. feel as though she's being constrained and being no. confined in one particular way and i think my attraction to stc has always been the same thing that they you know, you can just look down the list of titles and you think, well, you know, what could a song about called Fruit Nut be like? <laughs> you know, what's yeah. your dictionary? It just, you know, you don't yeah. need to know anything about the song, but you think, well, that sounds intriguing. It, exactly. It, Ex mm. it, 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 exactly. Uh, no, yeah. I, 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 I agree. No, not that there's a connection, but there's a similarity. There's a, there's a creative... <clears throat> what, I, what I find really attractive about uh, Andy's 
songs uh, and, and Colin songs is um, there's, there's a sort of almost like a na naive fascination with the world look, mm. looking at it uh, and mm -hmm. with Kate as well she'd, she'd be stimulated by things that maybe some many artists would gloss over and think oh this is worthy of uh, you know spending a bit of time on uh, um, yes, I, I, I agree, Mark. I, I, I agree. There is there is this sort of very creative aspect to both their writings, which I love. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love that creativity. I think. And do you think that as well? That's that the thing that I like about the songwriting is there's it's not just great lyrics over boring chords. No, it, it, there's always something in the music in some yeah, yeah. quirky yeah. chord voicing, and that's the same with Kate Bush. There's, if yeah. you're somebody who's not a lyric fiend. There's always plenty of nourishment in the There's music. Always, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a lovely way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. plenty of nourishment. No, there is. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. The inversions and you know, yeah. the voicings of things. Yes. Yeah. So like, Andy always has the odd cold voicing where I go, where did he come up with that? That's that's. A... I, I, I think Andy's a great guitarist, actually. Yeah. I think he's a really fabulous guitarist. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I say, they're fabulous. Everything about them, apart from their, their I mean, it's difficult. It, it, apart from their production ideas, or their not production ideas, production approach, I think is quite damaging. I'm just thinking there's a, there's a rather, just because of the way the conversation's going, there's a sort of sad contrast between if you talk to uh, someone like Hugh Padgham, who, who, who uh, produced... English settlement. If you talk to him about what it was like to be in the studio with XTC, it was just a, a joy. It was like a bundle of laughs. It was funny. It was hilarious. You know, it was very entertaining. And your experience at the other end of their career seems to be totally the opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But maybe Hugh's a much, uh, uh, well, Hugh's a lovely guy. Maybe no, it was a reflection on where they were in their lives, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't fun. It was hard. It was hard work. Switching the subject, you brought in Mike Batt, who I think is a friend of yours on yeah. um, I Can't Owner and Green Man. And, mm. and mm. by the sound of it, he worked very quickly on and, and for free <laughs> on, yeah. on doing it. Yeah, he, he does work quickly. He doesn't really work free. But he, yeah, I, th <laughs> I, th I, I, I think Andy bought him an Indian meal and that was it. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think that was it. Um, but uh, uh, Mike and I had done lots and lots of stuff. And, and I thought the... His effusiveness would be really good in in the arrangements. Uh, and uh, one of, I mean, River of Orchids, Andy and I had stitched t together the score. And um, what's the one? Easter Theatre, I remember we, um, we stitched an arrangement together. River of Orchids and Easter Theatre, I, I, I think, was... Um, there's a fairly defined sort of idea and sketch of what we thought the orchestra should do, and, and Mike refined that. And in fact, the best arrangement I thought was Green Man, which uh, yeah, it probably is. Which uh, uh, that's all due to Mike. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I, th I think that was it. I mean, if you're talking about Green Man, the the string sound is just gorgeous, and um, Sometimes, you know, you, I've I've had to work with strings that have already been recorded, the budget's already gone on them, and then you go, oh, my God, I've, we're going to have to use, like, 20 cues on it to sort of get the scratchiness out or whatever. And they just they just sound gorgeous. But as you say, it, you, you were used to the room. Well, and the secret, you know, we all know, the secret is in getting the musicians. Yeah. And they're great. I, I must say, I, I work a lot with orchestras in, in fact, well, just last week, uh, I had a string quartet in mm. to do some stuff on, the, on this album we're doing. And it's not a classical sort of thing at all. It's quite rock. It's a singer-songwriter sort of album. And, uh, I mean, the musician, the orchestral players we have in this country, just second to none. Mm. I mean, the sight reading is amazing. They've got great instruments. The intonation is stunning. The ensemble is stunning. Uh, and... And also, you know, if you get great musicians in Studio One at Abbey Road or the Hall at Lindhurst or, or Studio Two or Rack, you, you get great pe people in. It sounds great without you having to do anything. I'm, I'm suddenly a genius, you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> I remember years and years and years and years ago. I I, uh, the, I won't tell you the whole story, but quite a few things happened. And lots of my colleagues and contemporaries were trying to get in with management and get in with record labels and A&R people so they could get lots of work. And I discovered really, really early on in my engineering career, the obvious, that the people you really want to be friends with are the musicians. They're the most important people in the studio. No, yeah, managers come and go, artists come and go, record companies come and go, A&R people come and go, everybody comes and goes. But the musicians, I've been working with some of the same musicians for 35, 40 years now. And they're beautiful. They're really, really beautiful. And many of the finest musicians in London, at least, I'm proud to call friends now. Um, and it comes from them. I was going to ask, do you think that the com- if you compare Mike Batt's orchestration with Andy's, I'm, I'm guessing, no offence to Andy, because I love the, the final result, but that Mike would be more aware of the idiosyncrasies of instruments and like, you know, if you put woodwinds, they need to breathe uh, or, or strings have to change bow or those sort of practicalities of arrangement. Yeah. That if you just uh, arrange well, that, that, that's it. That's what yeah. an arranger does, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, the um, yeah. But, you know, to, to allow that process to happen, you have to relinquish some control, which is difficult for certain people. <laughs> but I, listen, I really hope this isn't sounding too negative about Andy because I, I, do, I do really respect his talent. And it's, it's just that thing is that I, I, I hoped when I got involved with the album that there'd be a lot more real performance playing, real live playing. But we didn't do, I don't think we did anything with bass, drums, guitar, together. Just all but in the studio. Yeah. It was all done separately. Yeah. Right. So the most vibey sessions were the string sessions or the orchestral sessions, were they all, really? For me, because there's more than one person playing at the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's that synthesis, you know, yeah. it's when everybody plays together, it, it sort of, it transcends the idea. Look. In, in my studio, where we started off the process, it was impossible for more than one person to play. It was a tiny place. Right. Yeah. But when we got to Chris's studio, Chris Difford's studio, yeah, there was a lovely big studio there, and I wanted, yeah, I thought we'd do stuff, and uh, I can't remember if the drummer turned up or not, or but somebody didn't turn up, and the studio didn't work, and there was this, and there was that, and this was out of tune, and that was distorted, and there's no mics, and... <sighs> So, yeah. So it wasn't entirely their fault that they didn't play together, but I was hoping it would be much more, much more muscular, if you like, from a performance point of view. I suppose it's also the thing of, of it, it's the other side of the coin of not being a live band is that they just realized after a time that they didn't, didn't ever have to play all together in the same room because they could create this stuff individually. I think you do have to, to, be, to stay good. I, th- I think you do have to. I think you do have to. You know, I, I spoke to a bass player yesterday uh, who I work with a lot, and I said, oh, Lawrence, what are you doing? Because uh, we needed to talk about an arrangement stuff. Uh, and uh, he said, well, uh, I'm going to have a shower, just have, you know, just going to have a coffee. But I got up and did, did my rhythm practice this morning. Mm-hmm. He does every day. He, he, he practices for four or five hours every day. But... It, all all that is so that when he goes on stage or plays live or plays in the studio, he's he's, he's really got a lot of stuff under his fingertips. Yeah. Um, but I think playing live is vital, 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 because it, 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 it's it's important to listen to what other people are doing. I think to to be a great musician. A massive part of that is being able to listen and responding. It's, it's funny, my favourite memories of playing live are, are being like the closest audience member, hearing when other people do something great. It's not really for me about trying to show off my keyboard chops. It's often been noticing, oh, Talvin, that's brilliant what you just did on that song. We weren't expecting that. You know, I loved those moments. It's that, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, 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 exactly. As I say, when, when those moments happen, it transcends whoever's doing anything, it transcends yeah. the instruments, uh, transcends the personality, personality of the people 
playing or people writing. It's just pure music. And I think it's such a it's such an incredibly valuable jewel we've been given that it really needs to be looked after. And if it's abused, I, I, I get a bit pissed off with it. I'm just bored. I think, oh, why can't you see how beautiful or how meaningful or how wonderful or how exciting or how passionate or how sad or whatever, how tender this could be? Why can't you see it? Yeah. And is that connected with your what you said earlier about liking the process? Because it's the, it, it sounds like you're a very present tense sort of person. You're not sitting on a collection of your own albums. You're always looking forward to that, to what you're doing at the moment, and that's the thing yeah. that keeps you in, engaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that live moment in in whatever it is, any type of art. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's really, to me it's really, really, really vitally important. It's my it's uh, lifeblood actually. Uh, is that it's not thinking about what I have done or and, and thankfully I've never done anything perfect because I think if you do <laughs> if you do something perfect then you, the rest of your life's a disappointment <laughs> <laughs> oh it's not as good as what I did 10 years ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do yeah. well from that point of view do you still regard it as difficult because I kind of think in my line of work it's, it's a bit of a similar sort of thing is like you can get better at it but you can never get perfect at it so you well, you don't want to get perfect at it because you, you, you're discovering things all the time I mean mm -hmm. talking about, about um, getting really really nerdy about three years ago I discovered purely by accident well I discovered two things in the same month children one is a, a, a different uh, an accidental way I recorded an acoustic guitar, a nylon strung guitar, and it's incredible. And the other thing I discovered was uh, just a combination of EQs on a bass drum. Give us details. What was the way that you recorded the guitar? Well, alongside my disdain for the Decca tree, yeah. <laughs> there's, I, I, I've got intense disdain of the, you know, the Coles 4038. Yeah, the classic BBC mic people put on cellos and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, some people do, yeah, I don't. But uh, it, it, it was uh, um, at Abbey Road. That's what, we had to use those as overhead mics, really. Oh, right. We had to. I mean, that was the, that was the sort of, you know, we first started engineering. That, that was the sort of stuff we used. I, don't know, I thought they're useless mics, and I still I still think they're useless. You've got to add 10 dB at sort of 12k before it sounds anything like a mic. They're very dull, aren't they? Yeah. Until that, it sounds like a sock. You know. Mm. So uh, anyway, I had one of those in the studio, of course, and I love uh, the Sherps range of microphones. Mm. And uh, recording uh, it's for an album, I was doing with a couple of chumps, and uh, this guitarist John, he, he he's got the most wonderful sounding nylon classical guitar and I thought I wonder what it would sound like with a 4038 giving it some body and thickness not that it was thin at all and then sort of quite close not pointing at the neck but pointing at the hole so it's, it's quite thick sound and a bit further back a, a sort of ORTF arrangement of Sherp's MK21s which are hypercardioid and very very clear it sounded amazing. So that was a little thing I discovered. It sounded, and, and John said in the headphones, yeah, what have you done to the, to the guitar? I've never heard it sound like that. Well, the thing is, because it's stereo, it, it need, you have to use it in a, in a track that's got a fair amount of room for it to exist. Yeah. If you've got big crashing, bashing drums and stuff, it doesn't really, yeah, it's just a bit of a nuisance. And so that was that. And what was the other thing? Combination of EQs on a bass drum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this is nothing. This is, yeah. <laughs> I almost feel embarrassed about this because everybody say, well, no, it's not. Yeah. But you know the Paul Tech EQ? The, yeah. the, what's it, Cut and EQ, boost the, trick where you... The, the one. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, uh, that's great. But on a bass drum, there's something about the 12K on that Paul Tech that is really beautiful. So I had quite a lot of 12K on the bass drum. For only, it doesn't work on the Neve EQ, which is great. It doesn't work on Massenburg EQ, which is great. It, it's just something about that that uh, thing. And there's the cut, yeah, there's the boost and cut. You know, 
um, yeah, because it, it's the magic piece of equipment because you, you're basically designing your own curves because one is sort of a sharper curve and one is, is uh, anyway, but uh, it sounds great. So there's two tips for your children, try at home. Is it worth working through the songs? It one by one and kind of talking about them is that maybe well we've it, talked about river of orchids already do, unless well i i think i'm not surprised that um whoever chose the running order put it first because it's like a mission statement it's more or less mm-hmm. telling people i think that uh, to be fair my memory is that andy always thought it should open i i, yeah. I think he wanted that to be the introduction yeah because it, it's like it's pretty much saying look this is what we're doing if you're expecting crunchy guitars this is not for you yeah <laughs> and also just the it starts from nowhere. It feels really mm. organic, and there's a, a lovely yeah. organic sound feel to this record. And I think, a, mm, mm. actually, the one thing I think about the record is that I hear those voices of the band much more honestly and and humanly than than the sort of man, certainly than the mannered style that they would adopt when they were very young. But yeah, the, there's a there's a lovely quality, mm. human quality to it. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, in general for the whole album, that is true. I guess as singers age mm. they kind of the influences in their singing style drop away and they become themselves um mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. if you go back to white music there's a bit of a kind of a wearing a mask of i don't know what andy would have be who he'd have been trying to be influenced by at the time but you know there were, he i seem to remember live he had a bit of a david byrne twitchiness and a kind of um almost elvis costello type thing and by this point he's just become himself yes and yes that's, yeah. yeah and that's yeah, true, yeah. That's true as well, yeah. I guess. i think at that point, I think Andy knew, not not in a big-headed, arrogant way, but Andy felt he was a really good songwriter because he'd worked at it. He really worked hard at writing. I think it's one aspect because you do tend to think of XCC as a band, and uh, but actually, when you just if if there's a way of abstracting the songs, it does feel like that there is a set of fantastically brilliant songs that are independent of the performances and the performances are interesting the arrangements are interesting yeah. but the songs yeah. themselves are like the the songs are fabulous yeah without mm. a doubt yeah i'm a fan of the songs yeah, for sure have you been influenced guy by as a songwriter yourself do you have you taken influence from their music i, I wouldn't say in any direct sense i think other people have influenced me more i but i do i've always admired the sort of qualities of Andy's songwriting and I mean and Colin it is true that a lot of the hits were Colin <laughs> but mm, the mm-hmm. the kind of eccentric ones that I would pick me in I mean Andy you write about Andy as a guitarist because I remember like he was on a Sakamoto record and he was on these other things quite early on because as a guitarist he would just play really bizarre chord voicings or or quirky things and it was uh, yeah and it was always things like that I noticed as much as his lyric writing or stuff like that that he he would always add some spice into the musical arrangement uh, he, he's a great guitarist yeah so if we think river of orchids we've kind of said a fair bit about that like song two is i'd like that um and that and after this um this kind of hard minimalist classical piece we we actually get an acoustic guitar and we get some hint that they are actually a a band <laughs> even if it's in a very rarefied form and it's got like the palmas clapping rhythms at the end you know the kind of flamenco rhythms and it's got gorgeous vocal arrangement a bit beach boysy I, I remember during the sessions us spending time and really that i was really enjoying because I, I love harmony and I, I, we really enjoyed doing doing the harmonies and the, the vocal really enjoyed doing the vocals actually that, that, that was uh, very I, I think andy and i I think we became the closest. We became the softest towards each other during that period. Yeah, yeah. And those things, that thing about and uh, for all his songwriting is that he, uh, we've we've all got the voice that we come with, and uh, we've all got the range that we've come with. But he will always, and Colin as well, actually, will push the range as far as it goes. You know, they, they, they will be. They will follow the melody where the melody wants to go. They won't let their own capability get in the way of that. Yeah, I, 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 it, it, it's fair and it should be said that they both have a fascination with music. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they don't want to go the normal route, really. 
and Easter Theatre, which is the next one, doesn't go the normal route. I mean, it's a, it's a, a sort of, it, it feels like a piece of theatre. It's a, a, a yeah, isn't no, it? It's gorgeous. Yeah, the chor- the chorus is such a release. It's just beautiful, really beautiful. Yeah, I, 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 I love that piece. I love it. And the vocals again, and the harmonies in there are amazing. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think. Um, Again, there's this uh, quirky thing about that record about the focus on woodwinds, which is often the element of the orchestra that that's right, woodwinds, rock and roll people are least interested in, you know. Yeah. But Andy seemed to be quite determined to get as much bassoon on this record as he could get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, the chord progressions are gorgeous. There's yeah, always, it's and, gorgeous. Yeah, 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 and harmonically, it's great. It's just a great song. I think it's a fabulous song. Yeah. I, Andy's even got a guitar solo. I love the fact that. Um, you know, I've, I've always wanted to record. I've never done a record with a guitar solo on it, <laughs> and I don't mean some kind of shred fest thing. But I actually love, you know, when the singer shuts up for eight bars and somebody plays something instrumental that's great and memorable. And yeah, actually, it's Andy on this one, isn't it? Doing that little solo after the first chorus. It is, yeah, and it's a good, it's a great solo. Actually. Yeah, it's, it's really, really melodic, good, yeah. really memorable. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes, it's, it's Andy. Yeah. I think it was that one that he was he was sort of sitting on the or an element of the song for quite a long time, many, many years, and kept on playing it to people saying, this sounds like something. It must, this chord change sounds like, a, you know, a Beach Boy song or something, and nobody could recognise it. And it was, you know, it was authentically original, but um, it was that feeling of a, of a classic song. Yeah, I didn't know he had that worry. I didn't know. He, he, and he thought it sounded like something. He was scared. He was worried. It sounded, hmm. It's interesting. I didn't know. Nights in Shining Karma is, is next. A classic Andy pun in the title. I love this weird combination of the vibraphone with the guitar tones, and it, it, I don't know if it's an influence, but I I remember I used to listen to some of these ECM jazz records where you'd get is it Gary Burton and they'd be yeah Gary Burton yeah and and it sort of reminds me of how that would get mixed up with a guitar that might be Bill Bill Frizzell or yeah it, it, in fact I think I, I think that may have been an idea I came up with because right I I seem to remember we had we had sons I had. We had mm. tons of samples at our disposal. Mm. We had an emulator sort of rack mounted thing and I had a couple of those. Mm. And um I also loved Gary Burton and that that sound. And I remember mm. there's there's a Brian Eno set of records done that I think it's called Pavilion of Dreams, which was lovely, lovely, lovely. Yes, with Harold Budd. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Harold Budd, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. And it's that that sort of lovely dreamlike sort of belief is almost suspended. Yeah. Mm, I love it. Yeah, the, the sound. Yeah, yeah. I, I notice as well that which seems to be a bit of a theme, maybe something you weren't into, but the, a lot of the percussive elements are kind of quite separate. So there's like some quiet wood blocks, some finger cymbals. It's it's it, it, rather than kit drums. It's all about. Oh no, these... that was that. No, that was stuff that I did on the emulator. Oh it? right. Well, there you go. <laughs> but okay. lots of buzzy. There's lots of buzzy noises and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And and uh, and Andy, Andy would play a bit of percussion. I mean, Andy Andy's sense of time and rhythm is really wonderful. He's got, he's got a great sense of time. So he he do. So lovely tambourines and wood blocky things as well. So that all, all all that stuff was a combination of programmed and played. Yeah. Things, which is nice. That, that's yeah. nice. Nice nice textures, yeah. Yeah. And and again, sort of somewhat beach boysy vocal arrangements on it a bit. As yeah, well, which it? is yeah. no bad thing. Yeah. 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 And and possibly I'm thinking as well, um, the influence of Judy Sill. I don't know yeah, if you know Judy her. Sill, but um could be there as well. And I know Andu was very very affected by her and there was something about the intimacy and the that sense of going in its own route but still being very melodic I, th- I think there's something there and then we've got frivolous tonight that's a colin song isn't it right yeah very funny yeah yeah, yeah. yeah the sort of musical rhythm to it yeah yeah great i, I was i couldn't help noticing it's it um the Mellotron, which I'm guessing is a sample of a Mellotron rather than a real one i don't know no okay. we've got a real one in we've got a real one in <laughs> Because Mellotrons have been a bit of a curse in my life because the number of times I've, been, I've come into the studio someone's asked me to play one and I've always gone like, this will break down after one take, so make sure you get it. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you, you look at a Mellotron and it breaks down. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I, uh, they're, I mean, I play a bit and they're, they're murderous to play. I mean, they're, they're yeah. murderous, you know. But uh, yeah, we, we, we got Mellotron in. Yeah, and, and then is it frivolous tonight? Where it's a really ridiculously honky tonk piano. Yes, stuff? really out of tune kind of pub piano sound. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's a combination of various samples and things and me being quite vicious with the very speed. Mm. I remember um, I had this book of King Crimson live things. And oh, yeah. Robert gives a list of uh, tips to musicians and tip number 10, it always says, is tuning a Mellotron doesn't. It's, no. <laughs> it's, impo- it's impossible. Well, that's, yeah. it's part of the character of their sound, that slightly flat, that slightly doleful sound, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's like strawberry fields, you know, the flutes at the beginning of that. I mean, if that was perfectly in tune, no, it wouldn't be what it is. Joyous, but yeah. it's got such a beautiful atmosphere. I know. Uh, I agree. Uh, 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 and yeah, Mellotrons are like that. They've got this sort of slightly lugubrious sort of. No, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm here. Sort of sound. Mm-hmm. But Hayden, aren't you quite? Um, uh, I don't know what the word is. Punctilious about about tuning. Isn't tuning a sort of important thing for you? I'm very flexible. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, not physically, I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I could, you know, obviously I know when something's black or sharp and, and uh, I think I think it's pretty, I used to have perfect pitch and as I've got older, I don't have perfect pitch, but I've got perfect relative pitch now. I'm very obsessed. We're not obsessed with pitch. I'm obsessed with intonation within a group, like within an orchestra or within a piano, or even within, you know, six guitar strings or 12 guitar strings. Or 12 ones a lot more forgiving. But I'm very flexible with pitch, with vocals, and anything soloistic. Because it has a sort of more of a human characteristic to it. Well, because I think pitch in the hands of a master, or, you know, I I don't necessarily mean male, in the hands of a, a, a wonderful musician... Pitch can be used as effectively as rhythm or melody. So, yeah, as a saxophone or a, a, a vocalist or a guitarist, I mean, look at Jeff Beck, for instance, you yeah. uh, can use coming into a note slightly flat and raising it, raising it or, you know, it, 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 it can be used so, so creatively. Um, so I, I'm I'm very flexible. It, it what's really important to me is the performance. So if a singer does a great performance and they say, "Oh, I'm a bit, a bit flat on this," I say, you can get it perfectly in tune if you want. But uh, I, you know, we can carry on recording. But I'll never forget how great that performance is, and I'd recommend we refer to this in ten minutes' time after you've had another few goes. Perfection. I don't think perfection is something that exists, so I, I, I don't break my back trying to achieve it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> we've we've done Green Man quite a lot. Have you got anything more to say about that guy? Well, I, I mean, again, I notice actually we do get some bassoons. I think it is um, the bass sound. Is that is that a slap bass? It's very un, an orthodox kind of bass approach on this. That was probably a period when slap bass was about at its least fashionable. <laughs> Moment. It's probably got revived when Daft Punk started sampling old records with slap bass on again. But um, it's actually gorgeously, in, gorgeously inappropriate. I'd say. Um. <laughs> I read something that Andy kept said that people kept on saying that there was there was a sort of Middle Eastern influence on Green Man, but actually it's a it's an English folk influence, and he doesn't hear any Middle yeah. Middle East thing. No, I don't know. I mean, it's very modal, but no, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I don't hear any Middle East influence. The the idea was he had a lovely description of it. He he wanted it to, wanted it to evoke the English countryside, but for it to have a paganism in it. You know, the green man, the pagan, uh, and. Uh, and from that, from the concept to the realisation, I, I think that's very successful. I, I, I think it worked the way he wanted it. He wanted this Ralph Vaughan, what did he call it? Ralph Vaughan Williams sort of dancing around a, a, some paganistic campfire. That Maple or whatever, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think, mm-hmm. it, actually, it's interesting because it does, that, that pagan theme that obviously runs across the record, it, it's... Um, it doesn't go full Wicker Man or or kind of no. horror ele- element at all. No, you know? it, it well, just it, it, it's just a celebration of um, you're talking nature. About really, quite conservative boys as well. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think that they're sacrificing a chicken in the churchyard no, at midnight? No, 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 no. They're, not, they're, they're, they're wonderfully innovative and creative, but they're not. They're, they're not anarchic. No, know. no, they're. <laughs> but you've just reminded me, Hayden, about 
uh, the way I don't I don't think I've come across any musician who thinks like, and this is unique to Andy. I don't think even Colin thinks like this, but he he he, he thinks in pictures, and so. Mm. Yeah, he's very visual. He, he's he's quite a wonderful artist, actually. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 part of that synesthesia is also that his his music often he he paints pictures with music, and, and he, he he certainly does. And I don't yeah. know of he's, another artist who does it. He's, he's a, yeah, it's very sort of don't even know if it's a word, but painterly, and very very English. Actually, I think it's very English. I think I think the and you know I I'm, I'm not nationalistic at all. You know. Uh, and I never have been, and especially now I'd be coiled from that description. But um, I think there's there is a Ralph Fawn Williams Englishness within him. And funnily enough, I see. I'm not saying it's similar music at all, but um, there's this sort of um, Edward Lear sort of absurd thing going on that is very attractive, uh, and. I, I thought the same, I mean, it's a tragic figure, but I thought the same about Sid Barrett as well. Yeah, yeah. There was something, I couldn't imagine an American writer writing some of those early Sid Barrett songs, and I couldn't imagine an American writer or a French or Italian writing some of Andy's stuff. I, th I think there is something very, very English, and I find it difficult to define what it is, but it has an Englishness about it. It's actually mm. a sort of Wiltshireness. It's like it's really precise. Mm. <laughs> Swindon, it's, yeah, it's Swindon. It's a very, <laughs> very strong sense of place. <laughs> and the more the more you think about the place in their music, yeah. the more it becomes. It, it's more it's clear that this is written by men who have bought, were born and brought up in this one town that was on the edge of the countryside, and you can hear it all over the place. Yeah, and also. Uh, uh, no, and he's very well read, and he's he's pretty mm -hmm. interested. Yeah, yeah. In, and he understands what that means. He isn't talking about Britain. He isn't sort of conflating it with some other. Mm. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. No, 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 no. Is no. there? Is I was wondering if there's could possibly be an influence of Jake Thackeray. Do you know? Do you remember Jake Thackeray? The yeah, do. quirky. Um, was he from Leeds or somewhere? But he wrote these very eccentric uh, yeah. song lyrics and stuff like that. And. Maybe I hadn't thought about that. Possibly, mm. I mean, it was mm. never discussed. And um, mm. yeah, Sid Barrett was never discussed, or the mm. the painter, the the painter is never discussed. But uh, Andy, and I, I, I'm quite sensitive visually as well, so I, I found that very attractive. I found these pictures very attractive. You know. Your dictionary comes up next, which is a bit of a contrast. Oh, F U C K. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which um, he describes as a song that uh, he, he he was glad that he'd, he'd got it out of his system, but he was then rather embarrassed to show it to everybody else. But then everybody else. Well, it's a good it, so. song. It's, mm. it, yeah, it's a good song. I mean, uh, just because it's so raw. I, I, yeah. I, I remember his vocal on that. I thought it was really good. I I actually thought it. Look, if you're going to pick it to bits, I think it would have been even more powerful if it was a touch less angry. I, I think anger is. Very, very, very difficult emotion to express in a song, in, in any deep way. But no, it's a good song, and I thought he he, he sang it really well. And um, I mean, I, I remember championing it to some degree, saying, "No, this is this is great." And it's a great melody as well. I remember the the, the melody is really good. Yeah. There's a simplicity yeah. and a clarity in yeah. the recording of it. It's, it's yeah. not cluttered. It's it's yeah. direct, and you can you can feel somebody just playing the acoustic guitar in a room. Uh, that was done in our studio in Lenham in Kent near Maidstone. Right, um, and we're back to Colin with Fruit Nut. You know who writes songs about growing fruit? <laughs> Is that the one where he sings about a shed? Man needs a sh yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's very poppy. It's great. I I that I do remember loving the bass sound on that. We recorded that at this uh, Chipping Norton. I seem to remember it's got um, quirky like '60s drum panning with everything on one side, and and I don't know if that's a, was just a sort of stylistic. I, I think that's a mixed thing. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I, that was yeah, a I, I, decision. I, I didn't do that. Yeah, yeah. That's just intrigued me. Can mixing ruin a, a good production? Or enhance a good production that could go either way. Ideally, enhance, yeah, all, all sorts of things can ruin a good recording, you know, mixing, mastering. I mean, mastering is famous for ruining stuff. Um, yeah, it can. 
I, I don't I don't think the mix has ruined anything. I, I remember listening to the mixes. Um, no, not no. The mixes were were extremely represent. I mean, the mixes went further in the direction that Andy wanted to achieve. So from that point of view, they're very successful mixing. I, I, I just wish it had gone, not the mixing, I just wish the whole thing had gone in a slightly different direction. Um, but, you know, once I, 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 I sort of said, look, I can't do this anymore. I just ran out of time. And to be honest, I've ran out of interest a little bit. And I've, I've never abandoned an album. But I felt if I didn't have these other commitments, I'd have carried on doing the album. But deep down, shh, I was, I was quite excited. I had something else to do and we ran out of time. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have abandoned. I, I felt bad about abandoning them, but the relief when they buggered off was palpable. Not because they're nasty as people, but the tension was just... And Andy was, yeah, Andy was hurting himself. He was so upset and getting so stressed and so angry. And Colin, who's a very affable sort of bloke, he, he was getting... Anyway, cheer up. Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Cheer up. We've got um we've we, I can't own her we've already mentioned unless you want to say anything more about that guy. I love that song. That's great. Again, it, it's a wonderful combination of its influences and um I notice Andy fits in certain kind of what you might call wrong notes in the arrangement which is one of those gorgeous things he does to make sure it doesn't get too chocolate box, you know, puts a bit of yeah, tension in. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. No, no, uh, I, uh, yeah, S- some of those things are very sophisticated and lovely, yeah. Yeah. Nice nice things to do, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, but the string arrangement, did Mike Matt have anything to do with that one or was that... Um... I think he did. Mike, Mike Matt did that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah, it feels like somebody's been in there to make sure it's all playable and... and yeah, it's uh, you know? a good arrangement, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Sounds great. The only two, I think, that we... we were prescribed in any way it was River of Orchids and uh, it's the theatre. Harvest Festival is the, is the one set in a school assembly with the out of tune recorders, a bit bit kind of fool on the hill kind of thing going on. Uh, yeah. so that's a lovely song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful song. And all the chairs scraping on the floor. Yeah, I thought it was a really lovely idea. And that beautiful line: the the exams and crops all failed. <laughs> yeah, um, Andy is brilliant at a metaphor in particular. That he'll yeah, he is. Yeah, he, he doesn't just come up with a metaphor and drop it. He sticks with it. And he'll take it all the way through. Andy was, you know, Andy's very very funny as well. He's got a great great sense yeah, of yeah. humour. Mm. Really, really, I mean, quick when I, yeah. when I didn't want to throttle him, I, he made me laugh. You know, yeah. I, I, I don't want to throttle him. I, I was really thrilled when he phoned up about a year ago. Really thrilled because it always bothered me that there was, it, it was fairly unpleasant, you know, the way we'd left things. You know. And apparently, to, to sort of balance things, Chris Difford also phoned him up to apologise. So there was a lot of kind of mutual <laughs> apologies going around. <laughs> so bloody <laughs> shit. No, yeah. It was a really tough album to do. And the last song is The Last Balloon, which, again, is the sort of song that Andy and Colin would have put on the um, as the light. It has a finality about it in the same way that River of Orchids has a big opening thing. Mm. Yeah. It, it feels like it was always going to be a final song. Yeah. It's got a long flugelhorn solo. That's right. That that was done by a friend of mine. It's beautiful, the flugel. He also played, he played trumpets and flugel on Easter Theatre. A wonderful player called Guy Barker. Yeah. Beautiful. No, it's great. It's beautiful. Yeah. Again, it make, it's funny that I do think Andy must must have listened to some jazz. I don't think he would be a card carrying jazzer, but there's definitely a, a he's got a taste for it or something. It kind yeah, of, he, he does. He does. Yeah. In fact, it's my idea to bring Guy in, but it mm. was the the actual uh, solo thing was it was part of the solo. It was Andy's. Mm. Yeah, but I, I thought Guy would execute it beautifully, which I think he did. No, Andy is actually Andy is quite a big jazz fan. Actually, he's got a big jazz hinterland. Yeah, because I, I could kind of hear that. And also, I think maybe I'm hearing strong. I, I hear a little bit of a Canterbury scene type flavor to the record. It's something that I don't know could have been influenced by Hatfield in the North or or one of those kind of Canterbury type bands. They're the right sort of age. So I've, I've never heard him mention them, but they're, 
there no the, I, I i can't remember that being mentioned but but they must have been aware of them yeah yeah because they were always yeah. the most jazzy of those kind of they were, 70s yeah. yeah bands weren't they the kind of soft yeah. machine end of things you know i just think it's a sort of gorgeous farewell and i like the fact that it's um it's not in a hurry to end it just no um works its way through no i, I remember <laughs> being very very fond of that song as yeah. Well. yeah i really loved it so hayden when you look back over your all the stuff you've done or maybe in fact you don't look back but if i made you look back <laughs> over all your stuff do, do you have a like favorites in your of, of stuff you've done or are you you know do you say oh that kate bush album was really good or, or, or are you just always getting on with it and not really resting on your laurels oh no I, I've, I've got a catalogue of really beautiful moments yeah, yeah. and times in the studio yeah there's so many things i mean sometimes it's got nothing to do with the music it could be just the people or just the time of life or just the sync what was going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. yeah i've got some yeah right really wonderful wonderful moments which as i say it, 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 maybe links to an exquisite piece of musicianship but not necessarily linked to an album yeah so it's not you're not clearly not putting on the album and re-listening to it and saying no oh, that uh, that's oh, one of the God, highlights no i can't think of, no. no i can't i i i'd rather have my tongue staple <laughs> to the lawn with a croquet hook. are you like that guy do you do this do you listen to your own stuff well i don't know it's it's kind of weird occasionally when you're you hear something that you worked on in a restaurant or something and it it there's always a mental torture of oh shit did, is, is the bass too loud or did i you know and, oh you know, it you, doesn't you, matter guys. you're kind of like <laughs> oh no you know <laughs> and you don't want to do that and i think it's better to not go back because then you can't the trouble is you know too much yeah it's like you know more you know too much to hear it the way that an, an yeah. audience a person who buys the cd or uh, and, listens on download but i, I do think <laughs> it's different for a writer as well i yeah. think the experience is different yeah I mean, if if I hear a record I've done in a restaurant or something, I just think, oh, I did that. Mm. And I, I remember that I, I, I don't listen to it. I'm not worried about the bass or, you know, <laughs> the bass is too loud. Is that in tune? I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't go, oh, shit, maybe I should remaster it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I do find it, because I've done some records that have been very successful, find it slightly constrictive when people mm. go on about them. Because, um, yeah, I've done... A lot more than one record, you know. mm. and, and obviously people are going to talk about the famous stuff. Now, I've I've, I've done some terrible records that have been really famous, mm. and I've done some great records, really fabulous records that have never been released. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I don't relate the commercial success of something or the financial success of something to what I consider a successful recording. That kind of fits with my own experience, actually. Mm. That I often. Um, if somebody actually was to say, oh, I really like that um, David Sylvian remix you did that was 500 copies limited edition, they'd probably like my work better than somebody who knows that I did a couple of Britney Spears songs. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, it, 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 is, it is quite interesting because I, 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 I do feel, once the work is done, I feel quite disassociated from it. I don't feel connected to it. But as I say, I'm, I'm not... Well, I do write, but I don't, I don't write for... Um, uh, yeah, stuff doesn't get released. I, I write for fun. Yeah. Do you think maybe there's a story about this, about XTC? Because I've heard John Leckie say that um, he's had more bands come to him because of his XTC work, mm. which is not his best-selling catalogue at all. No. Um, because XTC have always been loved by other musicians. I, th I think that's very true. Similarly, I got an inordinate amount of work because I did Kate Bush because it's, it's quite musicianly and, and XTC and uh, Pat Metheny and, you know, people say, oh, you did that, yeah, let's have a go. And I think it's somewhat naive that because you've done something successful, whether financially or, or artistically, I think... From, from a producer and engineering point of view, all that success gives should give you is a little badge saying you're capable. I didn't screw it up. Yeah. And because you you sort of you, you mix in good company, you know, you, you can be relied on. It's a fairly safe pair of hands. But to claim ownership of it, that goes completely against the grain for me. 
I'm not that sort of producer, and I never wanted to be that sort of producer. It's like you get, you get great producers. Let, let's say who, who can I think of? Let's say Trevor Horn. Yeah, Trevor. Is, I've, I worked for Trevor. He was the first producer I ever worked with. And this isn't a criticism. It's just the difference. Quite often with that, the producer is more important than the artist. And that I don't find particularly attractive. It's, it's like, uh, and nothing to do with talent. You know, he's, he's a talented man, obviously extremely talented. But for me, it's the artist or the musician that's the most important thing. It's a bit like people saying, have you seen the new Spielberg film? Where the director, because of his extreme talent and fame, is almost more, more famous than the story. Or the you know, or or the tune, or the artists, or the actors, or you know, uh, the the sort of thing that I'm naturally attracted to is sort of uh, much more transparent. But there may be, I was thinking when you were talking before about musicians, there may be a parallel with someone like Spielberg in the sense that when you see a direct a film director who's who's been associated with lots of not necessarily commercially successful, they often are, but but successful films. Um, it, you, you kind of think, well, it can't just be that one person. It must be what they're good at is having a good team of actors, a good team of a cinematographer, yeah, yeah, yeah. a good editor, yeah, all it, of that kind of stuff. It, it, and, it's having a team. Yeah, and, and, that's, and they're yeah. good at working together and that's, that they can produce mm. something together. So as long as they've got halfway decent material to work with, there's a chance that something interesting will come out of it. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point of view because sometimes uh, when people talk about people who don't know what I do, uh, or, or, or have got an inkling of what I do and you're talking to them. They say, well, what does the producer actually do? And I say, well, it does all sorts of things. But one of my roles I do see as being a casting director mm-hmm. is you'll choose certain musicians to do certain things, not because you want to tell them what to play, but because you love the way they think or you love the way they play. And you think, oh, that colour here would be fantastic. Or getting so-and-so to play the drums on this, or so-and-so to do the percussion on this, or so-and-so to do the orchestral arrangement on that. And that's a, uh, uh, and I think, obviously, that's uh, it's part of the directorial side of, of making a film, is you, you know, getting the actors and, and getting who you think would do, would be able to translate the script really well. And, and presumably, to use the example that you've brought up already, Guy, if you've got someone like Bjork, I imagine Bjork has a, has a tremendous team of people around her that are really good at, at allowing her to be as creative as she is. Yeah, I mean, she's got very strong ideas herself. And I mean, the two albums I was most involved in, there was often a sort of concept at the back I can't say by the time they were being mixed down, the concept had survived completely intact. But, and but it was kind of a good provocation to the musicians. Yeah, you know, yeah. like um, yeah. like her album, uh, um, homogenic. She wanted to have these huge distorted drums that would sound like volcanoes going off or whatever, and that. And then when we did Vespertine, it was like let's do the opposite. Let's make everything have no reverb and sound like it's like two centimeters from your eardrum, and everything will be like bubble wrapped in this kind of encased sound. That didn't completely survive, but it it meant that by having that kind of idea in the in the back of what the record was meant to be, you got a certain kind of character. Um, yeah, I think that, yeah, that's interesting, guy, because I I think that's important. I, I I sometimes try to work internally, and sometimes it's shared, but I I have a a quietly held concept. Yeah, it shouldn't be inflexible, but it's good to be, be there. No, even if you don't achieve what you imagined, it, 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 it's pushed or guided, no, pushed mm. you or, or informed lots of the decisions you make. Yeah. I like structures, mm. working within a structure. I think it can be very creative. I, mm. I think generally it is creative. Even if the idea is shit, give it a, yeah. if you've got an idea that's informing your decisions and yeah. saying, let's examine this, let's examine yeah. that, it, 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 at least you've got a direction, at least there's a, there's an mm. integrity. I, I think it mm. helps. I think that in, integrity is, is well, fascinating, uh, uh, important, and ultimately satisfying, even if you veered a million miles away from that original intention. Yeah. It, has inf- it has informed the way you get there. Yeah, and sometimes knowing what you, maybe this is the thing bringing us back to Apple Venus. Andy clearly had a sort of negative idea, um, which you know maybe that can get too censorious. But like it's clear that he, anything that 
made them sound like rock and roll or something was definitely out of bounds on this record, you know. And yeah, he didn't want he didn't want that at all. And, yeah, and that's no. why. I, and neither did Colin. I mean, right. uh, as far as all that, mm. and and then Dave as well, Dave Gregory. Mm. Uh, as far as all all that, I, I I think. I mean, Andy's memory may be different when it comes to Dave, but I think we all sort of agreed that this is a this is a great thing. It is a great idea, and it is a really good venture. And that is true yeah. of the entire output of XTC, album by album. Each album has mm. its own personality and texture yeah. and color, and you know, yeah, yeah. one's more rocky, one's more. Hadn't Dave done a lot of uh, arrangement duties in the past? He started with, I think it was Skylarking. I might One Thousand Umbrellas. Yeah. So I, I kind of what well, maybe there was a tension there because both Andy and Dave were arrangers. I don't know. Well, I, I, I know one of the points of tension with Apple Venus and, and the reason for Dave leaving in the first place was that mm. uh, he, he regards, despite his evident gifts as, a, as, a, as an arranger, his, mm. um, he, he regards himself as a guitarist. And of course. he was getting the feeling that he didn't have as much to contribute to Apple Venus, maybe more to the, the, to the Wasp Star songs, but mm. uh, didn't have as much to contribute to Apple Venus as he would have liked. And and mm. you know that was another source of tension. I think. I think it was. Yeah. I mean, when it came to the yeah the nitty gritty of the orchestral arrangements, I I, th- I I seem to remember Dave being in the room with me a lot more than Andy. Mm-hmm. You know, we we discussing. We there there was a sort of understanding between us about the the, the mechanics of orchestral working and arranging. Dave did feel marginalised hugely, and I felt sorry for him. It was a bit unfair. Yeah, he he, he was he was being locked out quite a lot. Though, when you think about the number of bands who split up after three albums or three three years or whatever, yeah, no, it's amazing they were together. Yeah. I mean, I, I did look at the room sometimes. Thought, yeah. oh, how can these three guys <laughs> bear each other? They're obviously really not enjoying being in the room together. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're not enjoying one <laughs> aspect of this. And you talked about divorce before, and, and when you talk to them individually, it's like talking to divorced people. They talk about each other like, you know, how's the wife doing? It's that sort of... Yeah. You know. <laughs> I mean, they're just grumpy. They really mm. were grumpy, you know. Mm. <laughs> well, I agree with Guy. It doesn't sound like it when you listen to it. That's a testament to them. Yeah, because you know, they, they finished it off and, mm. and finished it off obviously well mm. yeah that's it, good i would just say that um however um painful and uh tortured the process of making the record was um i don't hear the pain and the torture in the finished products no no but look I, i'm only 32 but look what the record's done to me. <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, i i really hope it's, it's been nice talking about it more it's been really good to talk to you, Hayden, and thank you, Guy, for joining in. It's been great talk- chatting to you. I've had a really good time. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Great. And great. Yeah, nice meeting you, Guy. Yeah. And you, Hayden. Yeah. What do you call that noise? Ah, that was great. A uh, big thank you to Hayden Bendel and Guy Sigsworth for being such great company this month, and also to Dave Ambrose and The Real Numbers for the music. And thank you once again for listening, and to all those who supported the podcast on Patreon, who you can join at patreon.com forward slash Mark Fisher. Thanks in particular to the following Knights in Shining Karma, Terry Arnott, Kevin Burt, Lorenzo Chachi, Kale Corbett, Liam Duggan, Jamie Dunn, Jeff Farris, Evan Fish, Leslie Gooch, Mike Grafe, Robert Graham, Camille Henry, Stephen Hope, Alan Hughes, Marek Krauss, Jesper Gumberg, Robert Lawlor, Liz Lynch, Murray Meikle, Yusef Murrah, Amy Parkinson, Mark Reed, James Reimer, Michael Sutcliffe, Steve Swift, Mark Thomas, Nigel Waller, John Wedemeyer, and Martin Whitley. That's all for now, I'm afraid, but I'll see you again next time. 